Their defense is a joke. What it really comes down to is I would love to have either of them. They don't have a, a prayer in their secondary. They have nothing. So you're saying just don't draft Blunt? I'm saying don't draft Blunt. He was unbelievably efficient last year. You know that they use their running backs in the passing game a ton. I'm drafting him tonight. That's Team Huevos. Huevos <laughs> <laughs> Gigantes. <laughs> Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. No Mike Tagliere today, guys. This might be the first episode ever that he's missed, but don't worry. It's not just going to be me, be me up here rambling on and on. We're welcoming back the prodigal son, Bobby Sylvester. He heard we were doing an NFL mock draft episode, and he burst through the freaking door like the Kool-Aid <laughs> man. Bobby, welcome back, man. Hey, Kyle. Thank you so much, dude. When I heard you guys were doing this podcast, I was so pumped. And then they were like, oh, yeah, we don't need you to do that. But then Tags called off. I don't know if he did it because like he really wanted to give me this moment. Or because he's actually like calling off to do a fantasy baseball mock draft today or something along those lines. I don't know, but either way, I'm really pumped to be here. Yeah, Tag's doing a fantasy baseball mock sounds uh, plausible, so we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, just as a reminder, you can find both Bobby and I on Twitter at KyleYNFL and at BobbyFantasyPro. Bobby, we've got an awesome guest today. Uh, we have. Trevor Sikama yes. of the Draft Network and host of the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast here with us. You can find him on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey. Trevor, welcome to the Fantasy Pros Podcast, man. Guys, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This is gonna be this is gonna be a fun podcast. I can already feel it. I love yeah, these for podcasts. sure. Well, yeah. Well, guys, let's just jump right in here. We're gonna be doing an NFL mock draft for all 32 picks in the first round. We won't be doing trades for this one, so Bobby, sorry to burst your bubble there. Uh, you can follow along with the picks and watch the draft unfold by going over to youtube.com slash fantasy pros, where this episode and all other podcasts can be found. And make sure to like the video and subscribe too so you don't ever miss an episode. All right, guys, this is how this is going to work. We'll rotate through selections here. So, Trevor, since you're our guest, you get the super difficult selection there at number one <laughs> overall. <laughs> and then Bobby will go with number two. I'll go with number three. And we'll just continue that rotation all the way through the draft. Uh, and we haven't done any pre-planning on these picks. So we're going to have to make these on the fly. It should be, uh, should be a ton of fun. So, Kyle, right, I just Trevor, want to clarify for right the listeners here. really quick. Yeah. So this is who we think they should draft, not what we think they should draft. Or not what we think they will draft. Correct. Okay. This is what we think they should do. Okay. Yep. Oh, can't wait for this to get so weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trevor, you're on the clock for the Bengals here. Are you going to throw a curveball at us, or uh, are we going with the the projected pick here? As much as I'd like to, you know, throw a wrench in this to give you guys maximum ratings on this podcast, uh, it's it's got to be Joe Burrow. I mean, Joe Burrow's got to be the number one overall selection. Now, here's the thing about Burrow: is he the most physically gifted passer that we've ever seen? relative to him having the best college football season that we just ever saw statistically. No, he's not. But the thing is, Burrow's very honest with himself. He's honest with his limitations. He knows what he could do well, and he knows how he does it well. When I talked to him at the Combine when he was doing his media session, he talked about his preparation being better than anybody else's. Yeah. He learned that from JT Barrett during his time at Ohio State, and he said when he prepares better than everybody else does, there's not a situation on the football field that can get him rattled. And we saw that this year, and even though he won't have the strongest arm, even though he doesn't have the biggest hands, and we, people made a big deal out of that, <laughs> and, and a lot of other stuff, you got to have faith in what he's got going on upstairs, right? The mental processing, the confidence, and, and where the confidence is rooted. So, you know, the Bengals need a quarterback. He's the best one to choose from. This one's easy. Is there any chance the Bengals trade this pick, and who would it be if they do trade it? Uh, I think the only way the Bengals would trade this pick is if they're honestly thinking that like Trevor Lawrence is better next year okay. and they're just trying to like double tank because it would it would make no sense really for them to give up this number 1 overall pick unless Well, you don't buy into the like, idea that Tre that Joe Burrow might not want to play for Cincinnati? Well, that no. Okay. I don't okay. buy into Me that. Either. And we talked to him about that at the combine and somebody asked him point blank, I think it was the second question that he was at the podium. They were like, "Okay, so Let's just get the elephant out of the room. If Cincinnati drafts you, are you playing for them? And he laughed. And he's like, yes, of course I'm going to play for the Bengals. Like, <laughs> Good. You know, he, he talked about having leverage before, and he even said, I, I think that you guys are overblowing that. Like, you took that to an angle that 
I didn't expect you to take it to, right. or like that 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 I didn't even mean. He's like, I wasn't saying that I wasn't going to play for the Bengals. All I was saying was, I have leverage in this process. It's a long process from now until draft weekend. That's it. It was never, I'm not playing for Cincinnati or anything like that. So, yeah. no, I don't think that narrative uh, has, a, has a heartbeat anymore. Seems like a smart kid. Awesome. He is. Yeah. He's a smart kid. All right, well, Bobby, you're up there at two now that Joe Burrow is off the board to the Cincinnati Bengals. Who are the Redskins taking here? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's interesting, right, because they could take Tua. Uh, I don't think Haskins is the answer. If I was Washington, I'd be trading this pick because somebody is going to want to move up for Tua or or maybe even Justin Herbert. Uh, but for me, if I'm staying at number two with Washington, I'm taking by far the best player on my big board. It's Chase Young. I think he's further along than Nick Bosa this time last year. Yeah, Chase Young makes a ton of sense, and especially for uh, the interesting conversation piece here with Washington is that their defensive line is already pretty good, and I do think that they have some holes on the rest of their roster. So for them to take Chase Young, it's truly leaning into, we're taking the best player available, the guy who we think can be a difference maker on our defense. And so, Trevor, for you, is this kind of the, the home run pick here for Washington? Do you think they could go to a... I think that they can because I know for a fact that the new coaching staff was signed on knowing that they were not married to Dwayne Haskins. Like if Dwayne Haskins is their guy, that's fine. They're like they're they're cool with that. They have a quarterback that they can already evaluate, which is actually a bonus, but they told ownership Ron Rivera and his staff was basically we're not married to this guy. If we don't like him, we're going to move on. And that's just the way that it is. You you might see a Josh Rosen situation like we saw last year where they went quarterback super early and then traded the guy they drafted in the first round a year prior. But all that to say, Ron Rivera loves Chase Young. I know that for a fact. Uh, there have been whispers that you know some people view him as the same light of Julius Peppers when he was playing with Ron sure. Rivera when they were in Carolina. And if that's the case, I think it's a pretty safe bet to even say that Chase Young's going too. Yeah, yeah, that makes so much sense. And and the Julius Peppers one is a really interesting uh, comp, especially with Ron Rivera there. All right, guys, moving on for number three here with the Detroit Lions. I'm up to make this selection. And for me, the thing that you have to keep in mind when making selections for the Detroit Lions is that they have to they have to win this year. They're playing for their jobs, Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn. So these guys have to be bringing in a difference maker, someone who can help them be better this year immediately so for them to take a developmental quarterback like Tua doesn't make a ton of sense because he might not even be ready to play sure. this year so we have to be bringing in someone who makes a difference right away either that or they're trading down to accumulate more picks and like you said Bobby it could be up to trading up to number two you know another team trading up to two for uh for Tua there or trading up to three if Washington stays put uh so for me I don't know if there's much more of a difference maker, especially after the combine and what he put on with <laughs> the performance that he put on than Isaiah Simmons, Isaiah Simmons, a linebacker out of Clemson fills a need there for the Detroit lions. Uh, and I think he can be a difference maker immediately right out of the gate. Uh, this is just a guy who I love to see Trevor. I know you were freaking out over Isaiah Simmons, combine. <laughs> just how special was it that what he put up, man? No, I mean, you know, we heard in college football, hey, he's he played linebacker, strong safety, free safety, edge rusher, nickel corner. Like, he played all these positions, and when you have the numbers that he did at the combine, the measurables, and then the 40-yard dash, it's like, okay, this tells you he can truly play every position. Yeah. He has a size profile and the athletic profile to be able to be that chess piece kind of player that, that teams are boasting and hoping they're getting. And so not often that we get a – top five linebacker in the NFL it just rarely happens you know outside of Devin Bush or Devin White going top five last year right. just doesn't happen to go back lot, to like but... AJ Hawk yeah <laughs> yeah and then I think Aaron Curry right before then was like fourth overall to the Seahawks back in oh gosh I don't know somewhere around 2005 ish but Isaiah Simmons isn't like a normal linebacker, right? And that's why he's not going to get treated as such when it comes to the NFL draft. You know, I've been seeing a lot of mock drafts that have Simmons dropping six, seven to pick nine. Um, the Lions need a linebacker more than they need any other position, and they need mm -hmm. a linebacker more than any other team in the top ten. Now, if they think he'll drop to five or six, maybe they trade back. But I don't see why they don't take Simmons. He's a top four player in this draft class without hesitation. Yeah, no reason for them to hesitate on Simmons. Just because of how unique he is and his talent and the roles that he could fill for that defense. They need a lot of help in a lot of different areas, but linebacker is probably the number one area where they just need an impact player. Yeah. So can't get any complaints from Pickett Simmons at the Lions. 
For sure. Well, we'll turn right back around here for pick number four, the New York Giants. Back to you, Trevor. What's uh, what's David Gettleman going to do here? Oh, man. Um, there's a lot of different ways that he could go. Obviously, the Giants would love Chase Young. They're not going to have a chance to get him. They'd love to get Isaiah Simmons, but off the board here at number four. So it's got to be offensive tackle, I think. Ooh. Of the top four guys, there's three of them that I think that Dave Gettleman could really want. Jedrick Wills, Mekhi Becton, Andrew Thomas. Not sure how in he's going to be on Tristan Wirfs just because he is more of an athlete than a, than a finished product right. and a hog molly, if you will, that term that Dave Gettleman coined when he talks about trench players. For that, though, I'll go Jedrick Wills here. Wow. There's a couple, like I said, there's a couple of different ways that they could go, but Jedrick Wills' tape at right tackle is just so solid. And he's a player who you could move inside and out. He's got versatility to not only play left tackle along his right tackle, but if they ever want to move him inside for whatever reason, if they think that they've got a better tackle option somewhere else to create a quote-unquote best five out there, Jedrick right. Wills gives you a lot of versatility to do that. But start him out at tackle, man. I think he's got great tape there, and he'd help the Giants immediately. This is interesting. Yeah, I, I, watching... I love Wills, absolutely. And if they want to protect Daniel Jones, this is a great call. Most people Gotta seem to have him as the number three offensive tackle on the board now. Do you disagree, Trevor? Uh, I haven't done my final offensive tackle evals yet, but I'll just say this. You know, I tweeted this out about a, a week and a half ago. You could take any of these four offensive tackles, Mekhi Becton, Tristan Wirfs, Andrew Thomas, Agreed. and Jedrick Wills, and if you put them in different years— there's a possibility they could all be the top sure, offense tackle yeah. on the board. And and instead, they're all in the same draft class. So, like, whether you have Wills as your third offensive tackle, first, fourth, second, whatever order you have him in, doesn't change how impactful of a player he could be. And I think the line between who is offensive tackle number one and offensive tackle number four of that group has to do with more stylistically what the offense is doing like are they having their offensive tackles punch early and get a first step out are they having them drop back into long sets where they're pass blocking you know two three shuffles deep forming these deep pockets what do they do really well that I think will matter for team boards a lot more than what it would matter for big boards overall for us because man if you don't have all four of these offensive tackles in your top 20 I, I don't know what you're seeing. Right. They're all starting starting offensive tackles. Sorry for cutting you off there, Yates. Oh, no, you're no, fine. You're good. I was just going to say, like, when watching Jedrick Wills' tape, the thing that stood out to me is that you're not moving him off his spot. <laughs> like, he is just – his balance is incredible. And for him to just stay put, uh, I, I think he's a perfect fit there uh, in New York. So, all right, Bobby, you're up here at number five for the Miami Dolphins. Are they going, are they going quarterback here? If this was what would they do – I, I would say, yeah, they're taking Tua or they're taking Harper. I think probably Tua would be the pick. Now, this is my draft. I don't I, – I, Tua, and, Tua and Herbert are great, but if I'm the Dolphins, I'm going for Trevor Lawrence, right? You have so many needs. And what are you going to do? If you draft Tua, are you going to play him behind that horrible offensive line and risk his career? No, I want to start building the offensive line right now. You talked about these offensive linemen. Uh, Mecky Becton is my number one offensive tackle. In fact – he was even before the amazing combine. I'm taking him at number five to the Miami Dolphins. Awesome, yeah. Becton, uh, for those who aren't aware, is a mammoth of a human being. <laughs> uh, six foot seven, three hundred and sixty-four pounds, and he ran a five point one forty yard dash. So he's not from planet Earth. So, <laughs> but not only does he just bring those insane measurables, but Trevor, what else does Makai Becton bring to the table here? Well, it's just how well he moves for a guy that size. There's just not a lot of players even in NFL history who have been that big who succeed why because normally they just can't move the way that they need to you know Trent Brown's an example who is succeeding in today's NFL as a right tackle around that size you know that's 6'7 350 plus range and Makai I think really showed us at the combine that he moves so well he showed in at 365 and I was looking at pictures of him I was even standing next to him and yes he's a massive human being but you go where are you hiding all that weight? He's so right. well built. It's not like it's like sitting around his midsection yeah. with just fat. I mean, the dude's just built incredibly well for a player of his measurables. And so even though history tells us that guys that big normally don't pan out in the NFL, history also doesn't show us a lot of guys who are built the way that he is, so evenly uh, mm -hmm. distributed with his with his weight. Um, and so, man, that's what's most impressive to me about him is is where his size is and, and how well he moves with it. That's what makes him worth a top 10 overall selection for me. Before we move on to pick six, I've got a really important question for you, Trevor, about Becton. 
Yes. If all three of us were to wrestle him, do you think that we could take him down or do you think he'd beat all of us at the same time? No, God, no, 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 we die. <laughs> we die. We'd, we'd die before the ref could get in and stop the fight. It'd be over. Yeah, watching him run down the track at doing the 40-yard dash, I was just like, if I was in the way of that, I would still be in the air. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> um, all right, guys, moving on here. Pick number six for the Los Angeles Chargers. I'm finally saying Los Angeles and not San Diego. Uh, they move on from Phillip Rivers, and they need help at the quarterback position. They also need are moving into the new stadium. They need to be bringing in something to excite the fan base there. Um, we know that there were you know, several conversations throughout the season last year where uh, Chargers players are saying this is like a, an away game here playing at home so yeah. for me they need to bring something that's exciting they have Tyrod Taylor in place there so they can be a placeholder and they can draft Tua yeah. here let him sit let him fully recover because we yes he's going to the plan is for him to throw at the pro day but we just don't know you know what his actual like is he going to be fully recovered to play week one of the regular season I'm not projecting that and so you need to have someone in place Tyrod Taylor's that perfect bridge quarterback for Tua to come in here and excite the fan base there in Los Angeles so Tua is the pick here uh Trevor any any comments here on what Tua can mean to the Chargers no I love it and you know even when they were deciding still maybe to keep Phil Burvers or not I said this is the dream scenario for Tua because of the, the exact reasons that you named there right I mean new stadiums coming soon give them some time off they've already got a quarterback there they're not going to rush him back they're not in this big winning window they're kind of in a little bit of a restart here and so I think that it this is a perfect spot for Tua to go I, I really do believe that so uh, the Chargers would really benefit a lot by getting a guy like Tua if they believe in him and if they believe that he's going to get back to the player that we saw when we were watching in Alabama because that's an incredible incredible passer so a little bit of behind the Absolutely. scenes for you guys watching on YouTube if you're wondering what in the world just happened one of my studio lights fell over and was about to land on my desk. I caught it like a playmaker. And uh, wow. so that's why I was getting up if anyone was wondering. Sorry about the interruption, guys. <laughs> well, uh, Bobby, we're glad that you're okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we're moving on here. Uh, number seven overall, the, the Panthers here. It's back to you, Trevor. The Panthers have a ton of needs here. Where are they, uh, where are they going? <sighs> They're fully rebuilding. I mean, they are just they are tearing that thing down. They're going to trade McCaffrey? Studs. Um, I don't think they're going to trade McCaffrey, although it gets really interesting. We could have a whole podcast really about Carolina's situation yeah, yeah. when it comes to their new owner, what they do with McCaffrey, what they're going to do with Cam. I ultimately think that Cam has already played his last game for Carolina. I, I don't think that wow. he'll be back. I really don't. Um, and then when it comes to Christian McCaffrey, shoot, if I'm McCaffrey, I'm not playing another down this year. Heck no. Not with a, Why not would I do that? a new contract. No yeah. way. And he's got two years, I think, before he is up. And no way I'm showing up. You saw the workload that they gave him last year, and it was when they still had you know, a chance to compete for a playoff spot. They ain't compete for a playoff spot this year. What's that guy going to run himself into the ground for a year that doesn't even really matter without a new contract? No way. Yeah. If I'm Christian McCaffrey, I'm not even playing another down either till they, till they pay me some money, and that's where things – start to get maybe really interesting if you were to play hardball with him in that regard. In terms of this pick, though, number seven, I do believe that Cam's going to be gone. I don't know if they're going to pick... I don't know if they're going to pick anybody in this draft, like a quarterback. I really don't. Maybe a mid-round guy to let the fans think that they're at least trying. Mm -hmm. But I really do think that they might have their sights set on next year's draft. And when it comes to you know Trevor Lawrence, Brock Purdy, uh, Justin Fields, go guys like that, as opposed to even a player like Justin Herbert, who would be QB3 off of this board. So I'll go Derek Brown in this draft. I like Derek Brown a lot. Um, perfect I think fit that for there's Carolina, yeah. Perfect fit for Carolina, without a doubt. Uh, he'd, he'd be a guy that they really like. But I'll say this. Derek Brown, I've been told from some people who have been very close to him over the last couple of years. You can um, take, that, take, take that sentence and try to figure out who I'm thinking of. But... They've said that Derek Brown is is just so good, so naturally talented that he really hasn't been pushed. He's never had to really focus on technique. Never really had to. Not that he's super sloppy or super undisciplined or anything like that, but just like maintaining leverage at all times. You know, like do, doing exactly what he needs to with his hands. He just hasn't had to do that because he's so damn good. He's dominated his competition in, co in college right, football. Right. In the NFL, that's different. You need technique. He's grown ass man. You're going up against. You know, and so. When you look at his combine, the thing that worried me the most with Brown was not just the fact that he ran an eight two two three cone. 
It was the fact that that's the fourth worst combine time of all time for a defensive yeah. tackle. <laughs> Derek Brown is way too good and too athletic to be running the fourth worst time. That tells me he did not train for this event the way that he should have. And that just continues to fortify the narrative that I'm not saying the dude's lazy. Please, everybody out there listening, don't think that I'm saying that Derek Brown is lazy. All I'm saying is, I don't think he's ever had to be pushed the way that he's about to be pushed in the sure. NFL. So the first year, year and a half maybe, might be a little bit of a wake-up call to him to get his technique right, to get the details, to be very disciplined in everything that he does. Because unless you do that, you could talk to any off, you could talk to any player that you want who's ever played in the NFL. If you are not as disciplined as you need to be, this league will chew you up and spit you out no matter how talented you are. And nowhere near putting the panic button on Derek Brown yet. I just picked him in the top 10 of this mock draft. But right. all I'm saying is that context is important. Little hints are important. And I think that means a lot. So there we go. Derek yeah. Brown, I think it's a good pick, yeah. but there's a little you know tidbit there on yeah, him. Yeah, I'll say yeah, a even month with ago, Derek- this was the biggest lock in the top 10 besides Joe Burrow at number one, right? But at this point... I was actually a little bit surprised that Trevor took Derek Brown here. Yeah, the the combine definitely wasn't as great as we could have expected it to be. I mean, even uh, watching NFL Network, they did the timer malfunctioned, I think. And he ran like the time show during his 40-yard dash was a 5-5. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then it like bounced back to a 5-1-5, I think was his final 40-yard dash. So, I mean... Yeah, there, it, it wasn't great, but also like we do have to keep in context that this is a really, really good football player and a top-tier prospect. Yes, the combine wasn't great, but we need to take that you know as, as a weighted grade and just kind right. of say like this is still a top-10 player here. All right, Bobby, you're up here number eight overall with the Arizona Cardinals. So this is crazy because Jeff Okuda is still on the board. He's like, he's my number two player on my big board this year. I got Chase Young number one. I got Okuda number two, but the Cardinals don't really need a cornerback. They need a lot of things, right? They could go out and get C.D. Lamb. I've seen a lot mock him there, and it's crazy. We got C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, two top five picks most years this year. Who knows if either will go in the top ten. I love Kinlaw here, right? They, they need a defensive lineman, um, and Kinlaw, he's a top eight player on my board. I love the guy. But we've got Tristan Wirf still sitting there, and again, we've talked about this guy would probably be a top five pick most years. They need an offensive tackle, definitely, to protect Kyler Murray. That was missing a lot this year. I'm going to go with Tristan Wirfs at pick number eight with the Cardinals, and Akuda keeps dropping. Yeah, for, for Tristan Wirfs to still be here at number eight speaks to the overall depth of this class, especially with Jedrick Wills and Mekhi Becton going above him. That could be, you know, a completely different order. Like you mentioned, Trevor, these guys are all kind of just right together, and it's all going to pe- depend on an NFL team's preference here. So right. Worf's going here is a, is a fall for him, <laughs> kind of, you know, in quotations, but um, I love the fit here in Arizona. All right, I'm up here at number nine for the Jacksonville Jaguars. You trade off Jalen Ramsey, you trade off A.J. Bouye, uh, you have Je- uh, Jeffrey Okuda right here on the board. It's an easy fit. I really don't need, <laughs> need right. to explain this. A if you didn't pick Okuda, I would have yelled at you. Right. Yeah. Okuda's going you know. right here. Uh, <laughs> corner, <laughs> corner has to be one of their priorities. Either I mean, they might even trade up like draft. pick four to get Okuda. Right. This would be a perfect fit. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Okuda sliding right in here where Jalen Ramsey was uh, is a great, great fit here. So Okuda to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Trevor, you're up here now with the cleveland browns at number 10 browns i got them taking the fourth offensive tackle in this draft in the wow. top 10 not sure if it works out exactly this early where all of them are gone off the board in the top 10 but with the way that this fell you know the giants taking an offensive tackle um you bobby taking the the becton at five Worf's going eight you know there those are two picks that could go different ways than ended up going offensive tackle. And I, I can't argue too much with him, but I'll have Andrew Thomas, the fourth offensive tackle, going here for Cleveland. Boy, that uh, that sours it, I think, for a couple of teams that are picking in the top 15, the Jets, the Buccaneers, the uh, Denver Broncos, who would love to get themselves an offensive tackle as well. And so that uh, sucks for those guys, but we got four offensive tackles already off the board now. Yes, it really does suck for me because I'm the Jets, and I was going to pick Andrew Thomas. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. I just got to keep you on your toes. You yeah. know, that's what uh, that's what a three man mocks about. <laughs> so uh, I mean, Bobby the, going, yeah, Bobby going right to you at number eleven. Yeah, Jets could Jets. really use an edge rusher as well if they don't get one of the four offensive linemen. I expect them to pick one of the four offensive linemen, and if not, I think it's either going to be Jerry Judy or C.D. Lamb. I like Judy better. I'm taking him over C.D. Lamb. Trevor, how do you feel about these two? 
Really like them. Really like them both. I mean, the top three off or top three wide receivers in this class. Um, you know, Judy, Ruggs, C.D. Lamb. It's hard to go wrong with any of them, and they do they do certain things super well, right? I mean, Henry Ruggs. Everybody knows he's got the long speed, but he's a lot more than that. He's got massive hands. Loves to catch your contact. Loves to be physical. C.D. Lamb, one of the best yards after catch receivers in college football, has a knack for finding open space, ripping through it, tearing up defenses, making missed tackles, and then Jerry Judy. Can you find a better player with with better footwork than this guy? The route tree is a ammunition to this guy that he is firing at defensive backs, no matter who you are, whether he's on the outside or in the slot. And so it's hard to go wrong with any of these guys. And so anytime one of them's getting picked here in this range, I like it. I like it a lot. All right, Kyle, that was really quick. Yeah, it's back to you at number 12, man. Yeah, yeah. And with Jerry Judy going there too, we, we have to remember that Robbie Anderson's slated to hit free agency. And so they are going to have a massive need at the wide receiver position. And and while I do think that, you know, the top priority for them is offensive tackle, they do need to build up this wide receiving core. If Judy landed uh, with me, the Jets, I think he'd be my number one dynasty pick. He could Unless, be. Unless like the I mean, Titans he took might a first be, round back or something. He might be regardless. I think Jerry Judy is just sliding in here right as a phenomenal dynasty asset yeah. right out of the gate. Um, for me, at number 12, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball here, but this is a player that I absolutely love. It's Kenneth Murray, linebacker out of Oklahoma. You I'm putting him here jerk. all the way up at number 12. Hoo-hoo-hoo. Yeah, for me, I absolutely love what Kenneth Murray brings to the table. His speed is oh, insane. Man, I wanted and for him Murray. to be able to come downhill... For him to be able to come downhill, uh, I, I, he's just one of those prospects that I absolutely love. And I think that Mike, Mike Mayock is going to fall in love with, too. A two-time captain at Oklahoma. Yep. This is just a guy that he's going to fall in love with. So for me, Kenneth Murray here. Trevor, uh, I heard you react. Is this a little bit too early here for Murray? What's kind of the, what's kind of the thought process here? <sighs> I think it's a little early for Murray as the prospect because when you pick linebackers this early in the top 15, they've got to be able to really impact the passing game. They've got to be good in coverage. They've got to be reliable in that area. Kenneth Murray, very good downhill linebacker, knows how to seek and destroy, right? Can attack the line of scrimmage very well, make plays in the backfield. He's a tackling machine. He's also an incredible dude. I mean, the work ethic is all there. We heard the off the field story about how he saved the woman's Top life. Top tier human. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, he's just such an incredible dude. He's got a family with three siblings who all have special needs, and the videos are coming out of him being all smiles, hanging out with him, playing with him at the combine. It just Kenneth Murray, when I talked to him, there was. He's just such a great guy, such a dude that you root for. Gruden loves Where to build I think the, that, you know, the the character of his team, right? Well, the, that's the, the culture. That's so the maybe thing at, is that maybe at nineteen, I like Murray at twelve. It's not. I don't think it's going to happen. But this is our draft. Um, I, I'm jealous, Kyle. I think it, Good pick, man. I, I think it might happen. I really Ooh, do think it baby. might happen. All right, so we're to uh, pick thirteen, and I am really dreading this because I'm sitting here at pick fourteen with the Bucks, and I know you're about to take my guy again, Trevor. <sighs> your guy i mean justin herbert's here oh yeah, the colts uh, are getting brady baby no if i'm the colts i can't pass up on this i gotta go justin yeah. herbert. justin herbert's still being on the board it's it's got to be him for the colts yeah. i think they're gonna make a hard run at philip rivers but uh they still need a long-term answer i think justin herbert's an easy one here for the colts all right good that was not my guy now that's that's the best pick obviously uh for what the colts need I think the Bucks are sticking with Winston. Um, you guys know me. I love Kinlaw. That's who I'm taking for the Bucks. I think he'd be a great fit for the Colts as well, but obviously not if Justin Herbert's there. Yeah, Javon Kinlaw sliding in right there uh, on that defensive line would make that extremely impressive. Now, Trevor, I know <laughs> that you're a Buccaneers fan. What's kind of the uh, what's kind of your feeling here with the with Kinlaw there to the Bucks? I think it's a perf- I think it's a perfect fit. That's exactly what they're looking for. Uh, I, yeah, I think that if Kinlaw is still on the board for them there, they could go offensive line as well. I think the offensive right. line class, depending on what it is, they could take they could take a stab at that. But man, if Kinlaw's there, he's such How a pumped that's would such Bruce a big thing for be? them. Oh, for Kinlaw yeah. or yeah, I mean they're that's, <laughs> it's that's what you want. I mean they 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 they're trying to bring back the whole front seven, but. I don't know if they're going to do it with Ndamukong and Sue, and then that's the only spot. You put him next to Vita Vea, whew, that's a tough interior combo to Shaq block. Barrett, right? I'm assuming they franchise tag him. We'll find out here in I think, days. yeah, I think Shaq's going to be back no yeah. matter what. Yeah, that would be scary. Yates, <laughs> this scary is defense. incredible what just fell to you at 15, considering the Broncos' needs. 
Yeah, yeah. For the Broncos here at 15, uh, they need to surround Drew Locke with weapons. Now, they've got Noah Fant. They've got Cortland Sutton. I, I'm still a fan of Deshaun Hamilton. I don't think that they're going to move on from him necessarily, but he fits more of that slot receiver role. They need speed. And so for them to have this guy fall to them here at 15, that's Henry Ruggs out of Alabama. Oh, over CD Lamb. Oh, man. I'm going to take him over CD Lamb just based on what the Broncos do. This need. mock's getting wild. I love because, it. Because because I think with the with the Broncos they already have that downfield contested catch you know with Court and Sutton I think for them they need someone <coughs> who can stretch the field now with C D Lamb running that four five I I think he can be that but you can't pass up Henry Ruggs as four two seven forty and what I think he also brings to the table and so for Henry Ruggs here at fifteen I'm going with them I'm going with him uh, because I think he's a perfect fit for that I offense. I think the Broncos are the most likely landing spot for Ruggs. I'm really surprised though that you passed on Lamb. I don't have a big problem with it. I like Lamb a lot more, but it's a good fit with the Broncos. What, what do you think about this, Trevor? <sighs> this is the guy they want. Yeah, I yeah, think that, yeah. I think Henry Ruggs is in with with obviously realistic expectations. This is their number one target, the guy that they think could be within range for them to either trade up or pick at fifteen. This is the dude that they want. This is who they want to complement Cortland Sutton coming off a really great year. It's this is their number one guy. All right, yeah, we're to sure. the Falcons All at right, 16. Moving on here to uh, 16, we have Trevor up with the Atlanta Falcons. Kayla Vaughn chase on the pass rusher from LSU. Awesome. Uh, he's He's got some you know, some rawness to his game. He hasn't been able to play a ton. He played a lot this year, didn't play a lot last year because of the injury. But coming off of it, you could see the flashes. He could be a speed rusher. He can get you with some power. He can use his hands really well. He's got a variety of different moves. He sets up guys well. He could drop back into coverage. He's everything that you would want from an edge rusher. He really is. Now, he doesn't have the full size of a guy like Vic Beasley, I don't think. But Vic was a player for the Falcons who had one good year, and the rest of them were just meh. I think that Chason has the ability to be the player that the Falcons thought that they were getting throughout the entirety of the rookie contract when they drafted Vic Beasley. So I think the K. Levon's much closer to maybe getting that re- result. All right, pick 17, I got the Cowboys, and we know that they need secondary help, cornerback, safety. But I tell you what, Jerry Jones loves to make his fans happy, right? And what would make them more happy than C.D. Lamb falling to pick 17 and they grab him? They could use a wide receiver, right? Uh, I mean, they've got uh, Gallup. Who knows if Amari Cooper's coming back? Randall Cobb's probably not coming back. But C.D. Lamb plugging him in with Dak Prescott, that offense would be a lot (laughs) of fun. fun. I'm doing it. That's so much fun. Now, Bobby, is that making that selection? Is that with the mindset of Amari Cooper leaving in free agency? Doesn't matter. Or are you Doesn't saying, matter. I'm taking, taking him. I'm taking CD Lamb at pick Get 17. Get them both, baby. baby. Let's stack CD Lamb, Amari Cooper with Michael Gallup. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fun trio right there. All right, I'm up here at number 18 overall for the Miami Dolphins. Now, Bobby had them taking Makai Becton, the offensive tackle, at number five. So for me, uh, we know that the Dolphins have needs all over the the uh, <laughs> their roster. So for me, I think you just take the best player available. C.J. Henderson out of Florida had a phenomenal combine. This is a guy okay. who I was high on to begin with, and then he comes into the combine and runs a great time, shows up really well in the on-field drills. Sliding him in there next to Xavier Howard if everything clears up. I haven't I haven't heard anything recently about that whole situation, but for him to either slide in next to or take over for Xavier Howard, I think this makes a ton of sense there. Henderson here at 18. Now, Trevor, one of the things I wanted to ask you with Henderson, there's a ton of talk that comes up about him and his tackling technique. When I was watching on film, I saw a couple things here and there. I think if you're watching that Miami game, you're going to say you're going to come away with that observation, but throughout the rest of the season, I really didn't see a ton of concerns. I saw him being willing to step in and engage in contact. Do you kind of see those same things? What's uh, what's your thought there with Henderson and tackling? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing with with CJ Henderson. I mean, it's not that he's afraid to get physical, right? I mean, like the dude's extremely strong to pair with great athleticism. Uh, there's some there's some tape that he has out there of, of jamming guys at the line of scrimmage, you know, getting them within the contact window, roughing them up when the ball's arriving. Like like he can be physical. That's why the tackling part. I think bothers people so much is because they know how strong he is and tackling is simply just having a want to do it. And when you have tape like what what CJ had at the beginning of the year, you get Greedy Williams vibes, right? Guy who has all the coverage sure. potential in the world, but 
there's no attitude to tackle. And if you're that much of a liability, right. you're not going to get on the field. And so that's not a guy that you invest in a top pick. But I think you're right. As the second half, latter half of the season came on, he started to show that physicality and run support just as much as he does in coverage. And so there is definitely a, a side to bet on with, with Henderson. But he's got to want to tackle. He has to want to tackle. Coverage is obviously by far the most important thing, and he can do it really well. But he can't be that much of a liability like he was in the Miami game. And he wasn't from then on in the season, but you just don't like that that's even on his resume. So are we going back-to-back cornerbacks here at pick 19 with the Raiders on the clock? Yeah. Or are you taking uh, maybe Jordan Love? Nope, I am going back-to-back corners. I'm going Christian Fulton. Right. Yep. Uh, I thought that Christian Fulton, I was never really a big doubter of his long speed, and then he put on the four four seven when yeah. he showed up and ran the 40 at, in Indianapolis. So I think this is pretty easy. If you got Kenneth Murray going at 12, you're going to get uh, probably a cornerback going 19 in Christian Fulton. All right, I got my jazz. Yeah, I out. love so that fit. Yeah, I love that fit there with the Raiders, I think, for, again, going to leadership and that foundation coming out of LSU, championship mindset. I think it makes a ton of sense there for Fulton to go to the Raiders. All right, Bobby, up with uh, the Jaguars there, your favorite team here at number 20. They took Okuda with uh, their first <laughs> first round pick at number nine. So who are they going here with number at number 20? That's amazing. And you know what? I want Murray at pick number 20. Is there any way I can still get him? Kenneth Murray? Kenneth Murray, man. I want him. Why are you take him from me? <laughs> I wanted him at pick 20. So here's what I'm going to do. I was like, right? no, he's gone. Yeah, I, I know he's gone. He's gone. Um, yeah, Kinlaw is not going to drop either. They could use a defensive lineman. Um, wide receiver, it's just so deep that I don't want to pick a wide receiver right now. I love Donovan Peoples-Jones. I would take him here as the best player on the board, but he might even drop to me in the second round. I'm going to take a chance where Denzel Mims will be there. Maybe I can get T. Higgins in the second round. So what I'm going to do, actually is I'm going to go grab somebody that I think is actually going to sneak into the first round, and a lot of people haven't heard of him. He's the number one safety on my board. It's Kyle Duggar. That's who I'm grabbing for the Jacksonville Jaguars at pick number 20. Ooh, that's spicy. That is spicy. Duggar in the first round. Yeah, with Kyle Duggar coming out, he uh, he showed up to the combine in a big way. Uh, and put up some insane measurable, <laughs> insane uh, measurements here and, and testing that kind of don't get talked enough about because Jeremy Chin overshadowed him somehow. Yeah. Uh, but Kyle Duggar, you know, uh, Trevor, there's a huge competition jump there. What are yep. your thoughts are with Duggar uh, this year? Same with Khalil Mack, too? though, right? I mean, Duggar's film is as clean as anybody in the entire draft class. Now, I'm not talking about just second year. I'm talking about anybody. His film is amazing. Yeah, Duggar's clearly dominant when you watch him on film, no doubt about it. And and you, you don't want to blame him too much because, you know, when you are an NFL caliber athlete playing at the level that he was at Lenore Ryan, then you want to see him dominate. And he did, so you don't want to hold it against him in that regard. But yeah. there's certainly going to be a learning curve. But even beyond a learning curve, look, there was a there was a clear-cut path to Khalil Mack being good in the NFL. Rush right. the pass, sure. right? Yeah. I mean, like, that was his job, and that was easy. For Duggar, it's a little different because is he a safety is he a will linebacker? You're going to put him at free. You're going to put him at strong. Is he just going to be a box guy? You're going to put him in man coverage. Do you trust him in that role? So there's a lot more to figure out to Duggar than there was to Khalil Mack, where you just went, this guy's going to rush the passer in the NFL sure, and he's yeah. going to be really good at it. So where I think there's obviously a high ceiling for Duggar, looking at his body type and how athletic he is, how strong and fast he can play. There, there's some stuff to figure out. He's got to go to the right defense coordinator. Not sure the right defense coordinator is in Jacksonville, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's, there's some of that to figure out. But he's a guy to bet on for sure. Man, people would be so mad if the Jags reach for Duggar at twenty, but I'd be pumped. So, uh, and this is all your fault, Kyle, because you took Kenneth Murray at pick twelve, and I was planning on taking him there. Yeah, don't don't put that on me that you took Kyle Duggar at twenty because I, I took Kenneth Murray at at twelve. Don't Just put remember, that on me. this time uh, last year we did one of these drafts. And I took Clellan Farrell, number four, with the Oakland Raiders. You guys remember that, all right? He did. I took a lot of crap on uh, Twitter for that, by the way. At four. All right, uh, I'm up now with (laughs) number 21 overall with the Philadelphia Eagles. And for them, I don't think they need wide receiver help. We know that. Uh, Last year was atrocious when, you know, their their top players went out. Alshon Jeffrey's contract isn't going to allow them to get out of that. Deshaun Jackson they brought in last year. I don't think they're going to be moving on from him just yet. They need help in the slot, and there's a perfect guy here who can bring them versatility to either play outside when, you know, or if. (laughs) I said when they're just out of habit. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey goes down or Deshaun Jackson. 
that's Justin Jefferson yep. out of LSU. For him to show up to the combine and run a 4-4-3 was very impressive, was something that I was not anticipating, and that was one of my only question marks with him, was just how is he going to – what's his long speed? If he comes in and runs under a 4-5-5, great. I think he's going to be, still be that late first round, early second. For him to come out and run that – was really, really impressive to me. So Justin Jefferson here at 21 overall for the Philadelphia Eagles, slide him right in there with uh, with Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson, give Carson Wentz some more op- uh, options there. Trevor, is that is that a good landing spot for Justin Jefferson? I think he definitely improved his stock here at the Combine. I like it there. Um, I had Justin Jefferson going to the Bills actually at 22 in my most recent mock, and so I think that this is the right range. I believe that Philly would love to get themselves some Henry Ruggs, but they're going to have to trade up to get him. Henry Ruggs ain't last at 21. No way. So this is a range where they could go with Justin Jefferson instead, and I actually like it. I I do. Justin Jefferson, I think, separates decently well. He plays a lot of roles from the slot, and so that's good. The Eagles are a team that likes to get creative with their slot receivers, and so um, Justin Jefferson is is a good one to throw in that mix so you taking a wide receiver here at 22 or is this where aj falls <sighs> aj's so tough for me because he obviously has some pretty good tape better tape last year than he had this year but there just are not many success cases with his size profile and what he put up at the combine athletically basically the only two names that you could think of recently are michael bennett who is truly just a different breed mentally and Trey Flowers. Like, those are the only dudes who tested similarly to AJ Epinesa. Everybody else who was like that failed. And it's really hard for me to bet on a player like that in the first round. And so, I don't know, man. I I think that there's good tape out there, and you got to trust the tape in some regard. But I'm really hot and cold on AJ, so I'm not going to give him to the Bills here. I'm going to go wide receiver. I'm actually going to go Denzel Mims. Yeah, baby. To the Buffalo Bills, speaking of guys who had a great combine, man, it's hard yeah, to find a player who, who really helped himself more than Denzel Mims did. A lot of people think that he could be the best wide receiver. Um, He's got the best that pair second... of mitts in the draft class, too. He, man, he, is. he and, does. And two, two years ago, he was just known as a vertical threat for Baylor, right? Running that kind of like wacky, very plain, you just shoot it vertically kind of an offense. And he proved over the last two years that he is a lot more than that. So yeah. I got Mims going to Buffalo at 22. All right, Mims going to Buffalo at 22. Kyle, what do you think about him? Do you have a first-run grade on Mims? I didn't going into the combine. He's definitely been a fast riser throughout this draft process, though. Senior bowl, he shows up, he impresses, he rises. Then he comes to the combine and runs what he runs. That was just insane and kind of, I think for a lot of people, out of nowhere, um, specifically his three cone. So for him to show up, uh, he's definitely a fast riser. I think he's someone who still needs a little bit more development, but he fits what Buffalo needs there with that wide receiver position. You still have speed for Josh Allen, but yet you have a size and catch radius that can help him out. So I do like it there. All right, Bobby, you're up here 23 overall, New England Patriots, probably the highest that they've picked <laughs> yeah. in a very long time. Uh, who do we have here going to the Patriots? Well, um, I would be trading back for sure to get my guy uh, because I know he's going to be there. I know he's going to be there 10 picks later, but the perfect fit for the Patriots right now with what they need, the type of player that they like to target. Uh, he's super long, tons of power. Raquan Davis is an ideal player for the Patriots. I don't see a way that they leave the draft without him. I think they trade back into the second round, um, but I'm, I'm taking Raquan Davis here at pick number 23. Okay. Uh, yeah, Trevor, what's uh, what's your thoughts there on Raquan Davis? I don't think he's going to go in the first round. I think he's an anchor of an interior defensive guy. Yeah. Obviously, he's massive, helps you out in run support, but just has not developed into a guy to give you much as a pass rusher. And because of that, I just don't think that he's going to be around one I don't, guy. I, I don't think, think he'll go he somewhere is on day two. Yeah, but. I, I think that uh, the Patriots are going to get, are, are going to get uh, Davis. However, however. Okay, there you go. So that's, I, I don't know. I, there are very few teams, I think, that could pick Davis in round one. I guess the Patriots probably could be one of them because of how multiple they go with their fronts. Yeah, yep, for sure. All right, hey, I'm up here at 24 overall with the New Orleans Saints. For me, there's, I would have loved Justin Jefferson to fall here if I'm the New Orleans Saints. I don't think that happens. So for them, you have to look at their their upcoming free agents. And for me, I'm looking at it, AJ Klein's a in, uh, free agent. They do have Demario Davis, who's been playing extremely well. Kiko Alonso, I think, is just a guy. I don't think that he's anything spectacular. There's a linebacker here still on the board that I really, really like, and that's Patrick Queen out of LSU. I think he slides in right here into the Saints defense, that 4-3, potentially as that will linebacker, and coming in and bringing some 
impact right away. So for me, Patrick Queen here, 24 overall to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Trevor, is this a slide for for Queen? Uh, where where sh- should we be expecting him to go? No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't I wouldn't say this slide. I mean, there's some people who think that he could go 19 or 20 to the Raiders or the Jaguars, but I mean, anywhere back into the first round, I think is great range for him. I think there's a lot of teams that could use him there. So uh, this is a fine pick. I think it's a good pick, and it's what uh, what New Orleans could need. Awesome. Well, the Vikings are up here at 25. We know that they need secondary help. Trevor, is that where you're going with them, or should we be looking at offensive line here? Yeah, a popular pick here, but I'm sticking with Jeff Gladney yeah, as baby. the corner that they need. I mean, they need a guy who could be a, a potential shutdown kind of a player, um, especially with the way the Xavier Rhodes kind of fell off last year. You're hoping that was just an off year for him, but they do need corner help, I think, no matter what. And so Gladney, Gladney's a popular pick here to Minnesota, but I think he fits the mold of what they want, and I think it just it, this is a good pick. It's a good pick. I know it's a little bit of a boring pick at this point, but it's one that I think they would need to make. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Bobby, you're up here 26 overall, the Miami Dolphins. They took Becton at 5, and then I had them taking C.J. Henderson there at 18. So where are the Dolphins going here at 26 overall? You know, I thought about Jordan Love with him falling to pick 26. Again, I'm going to wait on quarterback uh, because A.J. Epineza dropped to us. We need an edge rusher. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull the trigger at pick number 26. That's a good fit there. I do like AJ Epinesa still. Uh, Combine wasn't great. Again, we've talked about him before, but I do I do still like him and what he brings to the table. Again, I know Miami, you've got plans of putting him inside and just letting him bull rush everyone, right? Yo, he's I, a three tech. He can is we talk about tech. that? Yeah, we can because I think that I, love I think that he AJ played, Epinesa inside. Yeah, I think that his best. I think that his best role is honestly probably as a four eye on a D end for a three four odd front. Yeah. Or yep. as a three tech for an even front, but the problem is, is that it's not like it's not like Madden where I'm just like sticking some weight <laughs> on the dude and changing his right, position. Exactly. Like exactly. Epinesa even said at the combine, he's like, I'd play whatever position they want, but I've never played three tech. You before. know what I want to see? So, him play. I want to see him play fullback, old school, just handing the ball, let him <laughs> run people over. <laughs> Man, with AJ Epinesa coming into the combine, I w- had question marks like doing my scouting. I was like, all right, do I scout this dude as an edge or do I scout him as an interior defensive line? Because I was like, I just don't know what he's going to come in and weigh at. You know, right. we talk about you know schools listing their weights and those can be so drastically different than what they actually show up at and so he shows up at 275 you're like okay well I doubt he's playing interior at this point but I still think he can make an impact as that three tech Uh, so yeah I really like AJ Epinesa there as that interior uh, defensive lineman there for the Dolphins all right I'm up here at 27 overall for the Seattle Seahawks at this point I've kind of just given up the notion that I know what the Seahawks well are they're trading the back we know that's what they're doing 100 percent got it right trade back. yes that's that's fair <laughs> got to trade back <laughs> for me I think they and this is going to kind of upset some Seattle Seahawks and leave a bad taste in their mouth specifically from last year where they took LJ Collier right a defensive lineman out of TCU I'm going to have them doubling back and taking a defensive lineman out of TCU with Russ Ross Blacklock here um, for me Blacklock is a very very athletic player someone who can jump gaps at the snap uh, he's very very explosive and so for me I think just get him into that defense and potentially just load up on these defensive linemen you don't know if Jadavian Clowney is going to be back so for me Blacklock makes a lot of sense there Trevor do you like Blacklock's film where are you where are you at with Blacklock here yeah I, I like him um there's I mean if I'm being honest I'd pick Neville Gallimore and Justin Matabee before and Marlon Davidson even before Ross Blacklock but sure. I, and that's not to say that Blacklock doesn't have some skill I mean he's a good player I just think he's going to be a day two player he's going to help some teams out I think he's got some some decent explosiveness for an interior guy and um, when it comes to those top 50 top 75 picks you've got to have a little bit of a pass rush to you I think those other guys that I named have a little bit more upside whether it's inside or out but Blacklock's a fine player I like him I think that's a very Seahawks pick as well Kyle well done yeah, for sure. All right, Trevor, you're up here 28 overall for the Ravens. Oh, is Lamar finally going to get a weapon? Left. What linebackers are Nobody's left? Zach Bond. Nah, I, look, man, they got Le- 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 Lamar's the only weapon he needs. Sure, that's fine. Uh, what edges are left? Oh, okay. Year Gross Matos. Let's go with this one. Versatile yeah, dude. He, he's played zero tech, three tech, five tech, seven. He plays all kinds of different positions along the defensive line. Has the body to do it. Has the explosiveness to do it. I think in a rotation of what the Ravens are looking for, he could really fill a couple of different roles for him as they do have a little bit of an interior as well as edge need. He's a player with some versatility to his game. I'd like him here in Baltimore. 
Yeah, especially with Matthew Judon potentially being a, a tag and trade candidate or just walking in free agency. I don't think he's back there with the Ravens next year. So gross mottos here makes a ton of sense. Bobby, you're up here 29 overall yeah. with the Tennessee Titans. Are we predicting that Derrick Henry's walking? Where, uh, where are we exactly at? exactly where I'm going. Um, first of all, if they added a guard in the first round, I think they'd have the best offensive line in football. Uh, so I could definitely see them go in that direction. Uh, maybe an edge rusher here, but... Uh, for me, I don't think they're crazy. Uh, this is a very smart organization. They're not paying $90 million for a 26-year-old running back coming off 400-plus touches. I think that they let him walk. They go out, and they get the extra year by drafting a guy in the first round. And I think that the ideal fit, while Jonathan Taylor is the number one running back on my board, I think DeAndre Swift is the best fit for Tennessee. So that's who I'm taking. Interesting there. Trevor, let's, let's talk about that for a second before we move on. So... DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor, they're kind of the consensus top two here with J.K. Dobbins, you know, kind of this asterisk with sitting out the combine. So what makes more sense for you from Tennessee's offensive standpoint? Is it Jonathan Taylor or is it DeAndre Swift? I would tell you that if I'm the Titans and I'm picking at 29, Jonathan Taylor or J.K. Dobbins make more sense. Okay. DeAndre Swift is a very talented running back, gives you a lot in the passing game, can really tear people up in space. But in terms of that full-time role, I mean, if you're picking a running back at 29, you're, got, you're, you're moving on from Derrick Henry and you need a feature guy. I think Dobbins and Taylor have a better track record of guys who can really carry the load the way the Titans would need them to. And so I would have picked Jonathan Taylor, J.K. Dobbins, but Swift's extremely talented. So um, he, he, he definitely deserves some love in this class no matter what. Yeah, and it's splitting the hairs there too. The, those three are all phenomenal running Aren't backs they? and are yeah. going to make an immediate impact for for dynasty uh, fantasy football specifically. All right, I'm up here at number 30 overall for the Green Bay Packers. For me, I think this is where the the slide for Jalen Rager ends. Now, yep. Jalen Rager Good didn't fit. have a great combine. Um, however, <laughs> in one area, I think the 40 yard dash is getting overblown just because of his expectations. He was expected to come in and run a you know. 4-3 that was kind of the where we were expecting he comes out runs a 4-4-7 it's kind of where people were like okay I just don't know about his long speed guys 4-4-7 is still flying and so for me to add on with what Rager did in the broad jump in the vertical jump those are some great numbers and for him to come in alongside Devonte Adams Packers need wide receiver help so for me Rager here at 30 now Trevor Again, like I mentioned, the three-cone drill is not great. Is that enough for him to slide into day two, or is he still considered kind of in that round one area? It's it's late round one, early round two. It's it. I mean, that's where it always was with him and him running the three-cone. I, I couldn't care less. You agree, know, like agree. just watch the film. You know what I'm saying? So, um, no, I think that this is the range for him. Awesome. So we've got well, two great Trevor, safeties on the board with McKinney and Delpit. Is that where the 49ers are going? Uh, well, I'm up with the 49ers, right? Yeah. Yep. Xavier McKinney. It's easy. Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. I mean, yeah, you said it there. I think that he's a plug and play guy for the 49ers, a roster that doesn't have a lot of holes to it, a roster that just went to the Super Bowl, obviously. McKinney's still on the board here at 31. They're going to sprint to turn in this card. <laughs> what do you think about Absolutely. that, Kyle? All right, Bobby. Yeah, I, I mean, McKinney's a great pick there for what the 49ers need, especially with them. The, I, the ideal situation and scenario is that they trade out of this pick. They don't have many picks in this draft. I think they don't even have second, third, or fourth rounders. So nope, they need to trade don't pick back. against until the fifth round right now. Right, so they need to trade back. They need to get some picks here. So I think, But if they do stay put, then I think Xavier McKinney makes a ton of sense. All right, Bobby, let's finish this out here. The Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs, who we got there at 32 overall. So Kyle, I know you're going to love this pick. Trevor, I think you're going to hate this pick. Um, <laughs> they, need, they need a cornerback, and I'm a really big believer in Bryce Hall. Super smart kid. I know his athleticism lacks a little bit, but this is somebody that I think will step in right away as a polished cornerback and help the Chiefs get back to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I love Bryce Hall. I think uh, it's kind of, he has a ton of question marks surrounding him right now. Not playing much in 2019. I think only a game and a half or two games. It wasn't much. And then for him to still be recovering from his ankle injury where he's not running at the combine, ton of question marks surrounding him. But I think what he showed on tape in 2018 led the nation in pass breakups, I think. So for him, he's a very, very talented player, very smart. Trevor you know, just kind of quick thoughts here on, on Bryce Hall. Yeah, one of the best uh, corners in college football before he got hurt. The yeah. ankle injury, man. It was gruesome. Wasn't good. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's he's hoping to be back for training camp, and I certainly hope that he's right. That's what he was saying. But um, 
it, it's just tough. One of the best, like I said, one of the best corners over the last two years because he mainly played the year before, had a lot of great ball skills, had a lot of stuff to bet on. Just hope he's healthy. That's all it is to me. Right. I don't think he, he's not around one guy because of the health concerns. He's just not. This cornerback class is too good, but somebody's going to get a guy on day two where it's a, it's a high upside if it hits and he gets back on the field. Like Davis, yeah. like Raekwon Davis, I don't think he's going in round one. Like Kyle Duggar, I don't, uh, Kyle Duggar might go in round one. I, I don't think that Hall's going to go in round one, but I'd take him there. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's all we've got for today. Make sure to head over to youtube.com slash fantasy pros to see how this draft unfolded and make sure to click that subscribe button while you're over there. A huge thank you to Trevor Sikama for joining the podcast today. Make sure to reach out and let him know how much you loved having him on the pod too. So again, you can find him on Twitter at Tampa Bay Trey. Thanks again for listening, guys. For Bobby Sylvester and Trevor Sikama, I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning into the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.